Welcome to another episode of Afikra Conversations. Our special guest is, uh, I dare say, the world-famous art practitioner and photographer from Saudi Arabia, Manal Adwan, who is um, has made some of the most iconic artwork in and about Saudi Arabia uh, over the last decade. And it is an absolute privilege to welcome Manal to Afikra. Ahlan wa sahlan, Mikey. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I want to ask you, the the first question that came to mind was, every single bio I read about you um, goes out of its way to say, Manal is a Saudi artist, um, in that order. And I wonder if uh, that's how you think of yourself, as first word Saudi, second word artist. Um, it's very difficult to, um, I, this conversation I, I've had many times because first of all, when people ask you, where are you from? That's the beginning. And then it turns into where, where's your studio? Um, who is your main audience? There's always this, uh, a need to, or like, where does your art inspire from? There's always a need to categorize and make sure that it's coming from a, uh, a place, maybe a, this is a way for people to understand uh, better what what they're looking at in, in my exhibitions or when they uh, uh, look at me as a human being. <laughs> but in reality, uh, I've had, I've struggled with um, this definition because it is Saudi Arabia uh, as a term used in, in politics and the media is loaded and people tend to want to focus just on that word. Although I think uh, uh, most of my work is inspired from my home and my experience in it as a woman. Uh, So uh, I have a deep connection to it. But what happens is, like you said, people reading and trying to understand me will always lose themselves in one term, which is the the country I am from. Uh, I tried to sort of, uh, play experiments with this uh, idea when I had my solo show in 2019 at the Sabrina Amrani Gallery. Uh, it was in Spain, Madrid. Audiences there would uh, very much uh, look at the Arab world in a very stereotypical typical way. And I wanted to rid myself from this conversation because I just really wanted to focus on the artwork that I had made for that solo show, the topic that I was exploring. The title of the show was called Watch Before You Fall. And it was um, a collection that I was uh, expressing how I was healing uh, post-religious police, being removed, women's rights coming back to us and just understanding what what we had gone through um, as a gender, as a citizens. And I just wanted to get, I didn't want it to be that. I wanted that to be my personal journey. And you as an audience come in with an empty uh, idea of what you're going to see and react to the artworks. And so I told my gallery not to put my nationality in the artist statement, not to mention it anywhere, and just present me as Manana Boyan artist. And it was fascinating. It was very um really people started engaging with the artwork uh, much more in the sense of what is this artwork about? Um, Do I feel something when I look at it? Uh, Without turning to me to have a full on political conversation about the status of the Saudi woman. And it was very, very um, interesting experiment. Yeah. You know, we're, you're talking about your perspective, and I mentioned this to you before the call. Um, I want to sort of orient uh, you, your childhood for the audience uh, briefly and talk about where you actually grew up, which was um, Dahran in the eastern province in the um, 1970s, which is where Aramco is based. Um, and so I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit about how growing up in that environment shaped your perspective, both about um about your immediate surroundings about the region and about the world um well Saudi Aramco was uh, is an oil company it's a national uh, oil company uh and it, it created uh, compounds uh, as a concept to 
uh, sort of uh, put a barrier between the expatriate community that had come in in the early days to look for oil from America. So it was, I think, California standard. So it was uh, Californians and a lot of people from Texas. And uh, they created uh, these compounds that were replicas of America uh, in order to entice more geologists, engineers, drillers to move to Saudi Arabia and their families too. Uh, because back then to find oil and um, sort of navigate the research, you needed uh, years uh, to accomplish that. So, and then of course the Saudis that sort of lived outside of these gates eventually um, asked, uh, demanded, you know, for this kind of housing. Uh, they wanted to be inside the compound because it had better plumbing. It was quite infrastructurally much uh, better than the outside. And it became, I think, a, uh, later on as a, a, a statement of a bonus or um, it comes as part of the package of hiring you as a, a Saudi. And you, if you're um, a junior, you live in a different type of compound. If you're senior, you start uh, moving up to bigger houses. I don't know. This is the compound conundrum, I oh, call it. The compound so, 101. 101, exactly. <laughs> it's very bizarre because different compounds have different... Um, and this is one of the things that impacted my uh, sort of... Uh, the way I think, uh, what my world is about. So people could not come inside this compound, whereas I could exit. And I also grew up in a country that uh, for up until 2016, um, uh, people couldn't come in as tourists. So it was very, very hard to enter Saudi Arabia, whereas I could enter and exit very, very easily. And um, maybe that access, that privilege, the ease of movement, uh, both opened my eyes up to um, not everything is the same. Uh, there are multiple different narratives and, and ways of thinking uh, about one singular subject. And um, it was very hard to be a, a diplomat for for your own different locations, depending on what border you have crossed. And so uh, there was a language that you, you learned to communicate with everybody. And yeah, so it, it enlarged my understanding of uh, access and yeah. and what it means to have ease of movement. And when it's taken away from you, it's very, very, very hard. So let's let's move on and in, in sort of the story. When did you start considering yourself as okay? I'm going to be an artist, um, and this is something I'm going to do professionally. It's not just a, a vocation. It's not something that um, I just love art. I'm going to be somebody who has a, you know a beautiful home, and uh, I make good you know dinner 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 party conversation. When did you think to yourself, no, this is actually how I'm going to live. This is my livelihood. Um, I, I really did want to study art in art school. By the way, Mike, this picture is of uh, UPM, uh, which is in Bahrain. It's not Aramco. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but it's a beautiful building. I just kept looking at it and thinking, oh, it's cute to see the other compound that was next door to us. <laughs> I love I love the idea of the other compound. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Literally, we were door to door. Yeah. Um, what was your question again? Sorry. When did you when did you uh, start to think to yourself that you yes. wanted to actually be an artist as a so, livelihood? I've always wanted to be an artist, and uh, I not always, but when I wanted to go to university, I knew I wanted to study um, something creative uh, that I would uh, art school. Basically, my father did not agree because back then there were no galleries, no museums, no collectors, nothing. It was. You know, there were uh, cute community exhibitions. Uh, Bahrain might have uh, had some, uh, you know, good art scene happening, but he didn't understand it. Study art and then do what? <laughs> and so he, I think he wanted us, me and my sisters all wanted, the, he wanted us to have careers, earn our own money, find, be financially independent. So he's like, listen, uh, you go study computer science. And so I was like, okay, fine. I'll study computer science as long as I get to, uh, go off to college and 
I never got to study art. In the meantime, my mom used to sneak uh, money to me during my undergraduate and my master's degree. I did my master's in London in systems analysis and design. So I was still going with the computer thing to please uh, my father. But in the evenings, I would register to art school uh, in art school classes uh, in, in different universities. By the end of um, my master's degree program, I had uh, finished a, a year-long darkroom printing course, and I decided to create a set of images and submit it for an art exhibition, and it got accepted. And that was my first ever, in 2003, um, a Spanish institution, very random, very uh, in the north of Spain, in a city called Burgos. Uh, and it is the beginning of my story with Spain and my art, because they gave me the very first opportunity to say uh, I'm an artist uh, because I had shown my work. Uh, somebody wrote a little article in the community journal and it felt very fabulous. And I was like, oh my God, uh, it, it's it's possible, but it didn't become a, a true possibility like uh, being full-time artist until another five years. Uh, I continued to work in Saudi Aramco where I had worked 10 years already. Uh, and by the time I resigned, I had uh, been invited the year before by Delphina Foundation. I was showing, you know, so I was still working in the dark room as a place to save my brain and save my life. Uh, you know, I would finish work on yeah. end of the week, go into the dark room, print all weekend, and then come emerge and then go back to work. Um, as a coping tool. And eventually uh, I started showing here and there, had an exhibition in Bahrain and Delfina herself uh, with uh, the director of the Delfina Foundation, back then was Aaron Cesar. And they approached me and said, do you want to invite you to an, a residency? I didn't even know what a residency was. I was like, yeah. what do you mean? And they're like, you come and live uh, in a residence in London and we give you money and uh, studio space and you just to be. <laughs> what did what did your dad say at that point? Was he like, okay, all right, okay, this is a thing. He was fine. He was fine. He was uh, he was okay with it. He was quite sick back then, so um, I was already very independent, working for ten years, traveling, yeah. doing my thing. So it wasn't a surprise. Just nobody, also nobody understood what residency meant. So yeah. I went for three months. Even my job wouldn't give me time off. And Aramco, uh, I told them, I'm going. There's no way that I'm going to say no because I couldn't get time off. So I submitted sort of a uh, leave without pay slash resignation and went off. because I just had to just go explore this opportunity. And uh, right after finishing with the Delfina Foundation, which was uh, an incredible experience, it was... Um, soul searching. Uh, I made a very important body of work called Landscapes of Mind. I went back to Saudi Arabia within three months. I had quit my job, packed my suitcases and started, you know, calling myself artist, I guess, full time. Yeah. I, I was really hoping the story ended by saying, and I'm technically still on leave without pay. <laughs> <laughs> I technically, you know, I could go back at any No, <laughs> no, they... They, they didn't uh, accept my resignation. I had to do it a few times until they uh, agreed. Yeah, you know, People didn't sign. think it was going to happen. They thought that it yeah. was a whim. Uh, what is that? Who makes a decision like that, you know, after 10 years of... Uh, For sure. The other request, Manad, uh, I have of you is, I hope at some point in your career, you make a, some sort of artwork entitled System Design. I feel yeah. like I have. You think? <laughs> feel like, yeah, it, you have to. Systems design. I'm quite traumatized by the degree, anyway. But yeah, yeah. I'll do it for you. I feel like it's right. Stay it, tuned. It's, Stay tuned. It's, it's a <laughs> an album title. Um, <laughs> so you know, you'd mentioned 2016. I, I sort of want to zoom zoom forward. Um, you know, 2016 and the last few years. Um, Anyone paying any attention to the region knows that that Saudi Arabia has uh, changed pretty dramatically, right? Um, so I wonder: is there? Do you ever have this? Um, you know, you know. Sometimes people who like love music, 
always like to say like, oh, you know, I listened to this band before they got big. You know, oh, I was I listened to them yeah. before everyone knew about them. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you, you meet people who are like very interested in Saudi now and you're like, yeah, but you weren't interested before 2016. You know, you weren't interested in going, you you weren't paying attention. Now you're paying attention, but you're not one of the like the true fans. Do you ever feel that way? I do feel there's a, a crazy new interest in, in Saudi sure. and, and contemporary art in Saudi and um, academics are contacting me, uh, PR agencies, um, curators that normally don't work with me have contacted me. But then, you know, uh, I can't be so reductive to uh, what I have accomplished. You know, in the end, you, want, you don't want humbleness is nice but yeah. did not destroy the idea that i've been doing this for 20 years i've been traveling constantly i've been exhibiting making art um attending um talks um went back to school i went to art school and, and uh um there's been a lot of hard work going into it and it's not just me because you know if it was just me and you know it's just an empty one person kind of uh, monolithic uh, narrative or story of the Saudi Arabian art scene. But the whole Saudi Arabian art scene was really incredibly grassroots and doing some incredible work. And it was bound to happen that there was, and, and what came in, because you know we have a lot of amazing uh, underground or very established art movements everywhere. It's just when um, the government uh, comes in and injects uh, support for public art, for museums to build collections, yeah. um, you know, uh, sending people on scholarships and creative. This is when it becomes really exciting. And I think this is natural that then everybody turns around and says, okay, there's something happening. It's not dead there. There's yeah. something very interesting, very new, exciting. Uh and then you have to stay wary of uh, you know the creeps and weirdos, right? Uh, and you can tell who they are because there is no depth in their questioning. There is no yeah. um, warmth and truth in in their intent, and it's yeah. very hard to spot it. And artists, uh, you know, some artists are equipped to be very sensitive and can some get duped. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, like, um, uh, the other, other thing, just to tack onto that question, the other sort of sentence I hear or have heard is like, oh, you know, there is a Renaissance. There's a, this is like a, a golden age of art in Saudi. So I guess I have two questions about that. One is, do you feel like this is a golden age? Um, and two, if that's true, what existed before this golden age? Because it sort of uh, suggests that this was it was this like barren wasteland. And then all of a sudden, like there is a golden age, which I don't think is is fair. It's not. But then also, what the, first of all, uh, golden age and renaissance are very um, just terms that do not apply, in my opinion. Uh, for yeah. various reasons but uh and it's just the beginning you know for contemporary art but modern art has existed before us but let's be truthful Saudi Arabia is a very young country and I don't I hate and I think it's unfair to be measured against different art canons that uh, existed in longer periods or um you know uh just has a different history than our society so now, uh, art, poetry, uh, science, all of that used to mix together uh, in one cocktail in the, you know, in Arabian history. Uh, Nabataeans have existed 5,000 years before uh, Christ, so BC. And look at the art that, and architecture that they developed. And I don't know what survived them. Yeah, and this is just rocks that are carved that survived. What else have we lost? And so it's a very, very, um, a, a, not a good intentioned way of framing that um, this is a new, a new art uh, thing. This is a new uh, period because you know we do belong to the uh, larger narrative of humanity and 
and what they've built and what they've inscribed on stones and uh, thanks to Al-Ula now we know that and and then I uh, look at uh, you know Arab history and, and Persian history which pours also into ours uh, you know the calligraphy that was developed and this is a highly and this is one of the art forms in the Arab world that has survived so well and has evolved uh, naturally because um, calligraphy and music uh, are two forms of art and creativity that were very hard to colonize and very hard to infiltrate. So they continue to survive within the purest um, school of thinking and, and, and craftsmanship. And today we have amazing, um, uh, beautiful acts of uh, composing and music and use of uh, musical tools and um, calligraphy, I think, is the basis of most of uh, the art movement in, uh, that uh, was built on it and expanded beyond it. Uh, you know, the Iraqis and Hurufiyat and their use of Arabic words. I use a lot of Arabic words in my my text, um, my artworks, but um, they're different in, in meaning. So I'm not writing them myself. They're sort of uh, a reference to archives. But yeah. <laughs> I, that was a long run. No, no, no. It's, it's, <laughs> it is super interesting. I like it because um, there's the the recency of the, the sort of the, the nation state, and it's a really point. It's a point really well taken, right? So this idea of how young the the actual nation is, but how long the history is, right? So you're talking about the Nevitian, um and for those who don't know. Um, the sort of most uh, obvious examples of those two, or the most sort of con, uh, conspicuous examples of the, that, uh, that civilization is is Petra and Al Ula, those two monumental, Jordan. And, and Jordan and in Al Ula, the Madah um, and Saleh, those incredible, incredible sites to behold. Um, you know, I'm curious about when you were sort of developing your practice. Do you feel like you have have a specific style? Like w- when people see your work, do you hope that they say, "Oh, that's a that's a manad work," or do you feel like, "No, I don't really have a specific style. I have a specific practice, or I have a specific set of ideas that I'm trying to unpack across my all my different work." Uh, I don't think I stuck with any kind of material ever for very long. So uh, there was, you know, my beginnings were in black and white photography and I hated it when people um, called me photographer because it really was limiting. And I started making silk screens on top of the photograph. So layering my thoughts, going beyond the just simple, straightforward lens to, to frame. And then I started adding things like this, letters, uh, graffiti, neon. Um, I also started getting rid of the frame. I hated the idea that that was such a a barrier between you, the viewer, and the artwork. So this, uh, for example, this artwork has no frame. Yeah. It's hung in strips. Uh, and then I started creating large-scale installations. And in all of these artworks that I've made, I've never really use the same material. Now, this is not because I'm a smart woman. This is a very, very bad, you know, because you have to have this really steep learning curve with this new material quickly and yeah. express your idea with it, uh, even though you don't know it, you're not so familiar with it and it becomes complicated. Um, I do stick around the same material for a few years, a couple of years, but I quickly change because I get tired or bored or uh, I'm I'm easily distracted by a new material. Like, oh, what is this? Uh, let's try that out. It's cool. You know, forget about the old stuff I used to do. Um, and so I, I usually think that my work is, you know, my whole career is uh, tied within a few questions uh, that I pose within my practice. And you know, those questions have changed because I've grown. Um, my experiences yeah. have made me, a, you know, a different woman uh, in different stages. And of course, uh, the conversation inside the head changes too. 
And so you will see a sort of progression of this change in my in my works. Uh, but could it be that my work might be uh, conceptual more and the medium is is sort of one of the elements that expresses the idea. So, you know, I don't just, uh, the medium is not something that you put to the side, whatever, it's it's given and it belongs to the artwork. No, it tells also tells a story alongside the artwork. You know, for example, yeah. this, uh, if you go back to the image right before, this is a news clipping. I didn't take this picture. Uh, mm. It was um, a series that, of uh, photographs that me and my mother collected for about three years from our local newspaper, Jerry de Tellion, uh, which basically had at that point a red line against showing a woman's face in its pages. And so we would uh, buy the magazine every single day looking for images of women and how they represent, because they have, they have to write about women because, yeah. you know, we exist. And so, you know, any article about women's, I don't know, like job openings in schools or, I don't know, somebody had a car crash or there was a conference. This is, that was the image that they used uh, to represent women, always not singular in, in groups and um, completely uh, ghost-like, uh, non-human. And, you know, and I argue that this kind of approach contributes to the dehumanization of women when there is no form for them or face or name or sound. Um, so yeah, the, and this is, this medium uh, spoke to the concept that, and the way the artwork was cut up is because uh, it needed to be fragmented as an idea uh, and studied. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question um, about if you were to give advice to a young, a younger artist, you know, somebody in the early part of their career, um, who is worried that that sort of Western media outlets or Western viewers who are not as familiar with the Arab world and, and very specifically not as familiar with Saudi, um, may sort of view works like this as saying like, oh, downtrodden you know the, the stereotype of the downtrodden woman and this the artist uh, this thing the single artist has bucked the norm and is uh as empowered enough to stand up for all these um all these uh nameless faceless women um i feel like there is some sort of uh um burden that those artists have to actually there by saying like, okay, like I'm not trying to play into this stereotype, but at the same time, I want to talk about this issue, but I don't know if this audience is, is my audience. Um, like what advice would you uh, give to that type of artist to sort of navigate those troubled waters? And, may, and maybe, maybe you don't think they're troubled at all. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, sort of. Um, so what you're saying is that uh, sometimes being the first or uh, being uh, somebody that exhibits abroad and my encounter with an audience that completely does not understand where uh, what Saudi is about and again, the focus about my country and, and where I'm from. Um, you know, I wouldn't have any advice because it's very, very hard to navigate because, uh, uh, and I have to confess, it is one of the most difficult and um, annoying. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you, you take it upon yourself. Uh, and the idea is to address that, uh, first of all, this um, exceptionalism uh, that three women in Saudi Arabia might hold is that they're exceptional is so incorrect. Like there's hundreds and thousands of amazing, incredible women. And I don't know why and until when will uh, people still be shocked by the exceptionalism of the Saudi women. Um, and, uh, and then the monolith, uh, you know, placing all women under the umbrella of one, which, you know, uh, it's something that is a habit of somebody that is lazy or has not um, 
experienced worlds, but, you know, you have to deal with all these characters. Um, I've had people come up to me and say, how did you learn to be so international? Um, where did you learn your English? In uh, You know, there's uh, it's, it's a hard, hard to navigate these waters. But in the end, uh, if you are a creative uh, and an artist, um, I say stick to your art and ignore the noise. Um, you don't need to answer anybody's questions or live up or or make art for a certain audience versus another. Just make what you are truthful about uh, and uh, work hard, hard, uh, like with love and passion and and make pieces that are honest and, and um, thoughtful and and pose questions and answer questions and and really carry your narrative as a human being. And that's it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to talk to people about politics, history, nationhood. Uh, these are very secondary to creative uh, making. And even if these topics seep into your work, it is because it is intentional and it is your experience and you're allowed to have it. You yeah. Don't to, you don't need to justify it. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, just like from from my perspective, whenever anyone says I live in Beirut, and whenever anyone says to me like, "Oh, you know, like uh, somebody who I run into in New York, for example, who's like, "Oh my God, living in Beirut must be awful. It must be terrible. That must be like, how are you dealing with it? Like, I, I'm I'm defensive. I'm always like, you don't understand. It's actually not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> but if I'm speaking to the, a Lebanese friend of mine or somebody who I know at least knows Beirut really well. I'm like, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so it's horrendous. Of course. Yeah. yeah. It happens. That's a, and uh, you know, you complain to your inner circle and anyway, it's the art world itself is, you know, you have your personal, your personal life and, sure. and, and then you have a, a face because in the end it's a lot of people podcast has a lot of people watching it you know you cannot be um fully exposed it's it's too dangerous emotionally and mentally so you know you need to have a film that uh, a protective layer uh also uh, regarding your narrative also um regarding how your work and your art you can't just spill it out there and let somebody uh, stomp all over it unless yeah you, you have very very tough tough skin and this yeah. is another piece of advice for anybody that's young and starting in anywhere in the art world um uh perseverance uh that's the that's what makes anybody successful is to you know continue to do what you need to do without and of course in that journey you're going to be kicked punched and really really um will will we'll face obstacles that are very difficult and you have to mentally be uh convinced with all your heart that this is the only path that you will walk and uh, uh in the end you will be successful it's just uh, you need to have really uh resilience and tough skin yeah do you feel like that the art world and the 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 contemporary art world across the arab world <laughs> is one scene you know like do you feel like it's kind of all one scene, what's going on in Beirut and what's going on in Kuwait and Dubai and Bahrain and Qatar and Jeddah and Riyadh and Cairo are all sort of this contiguous landmass. Um, and it has broader, you know, planets in the solar system in London and, and New York and wherever. Do you feel like it is actually one scene and everyone is kind of shoulder to shoulder? Yeah, because we live in inside this art world, uh, Mikey. We think that we all, everybody knows about these people, and then nobody, the majority of uh, the populations of this earth, do not know nothing about us and the art world and what we're doing. You know, um, had to, I remember my nieces and nephews saw that I, I was on a YouTube like video of some sort. I know oh, you're famous, Khalam and I'm like, I'm only famous among my friends. That's it. <laughs> There's people who really know the art world or, but um, no, I, I think, yes, we are connected. And I love that. I love that so much, Mikey, because, uh, um, you know, working in the studio, uh, uh, 
working in very complex emotional ideas you, say, you feel lonely and yeah, it is um you know you go to your friends and you go to your family but in reality people who are uh, truly experiencing what you experience are fellow artists and I have over the years have met and um, uh, became friends with many artists from the Arab world because our experiences are very close to each other um, our thinking is uh, yeah, need the way uh, you know the way we're brought up and the language we use uh, it connects me and uh, it's really cool to I think um, the first encounters I had with any artists started off when Edge of Arabia, uh, um, well, it wasn't Edge of Arabia then, but uh, Stephen Stapleton and Ahmed Matar drove from Abha to the Eastern province to visit me and invite me to join their uh, exhibition, Edge of Arabia. The first one was in London. And I remember being so excited. I couldn't believe there were other Saudi outers, another Saudi that's working in temp contemporary art on the other side of the kingdom and who are they and, and what's their art like that was my obsession I just wanted them to come of course I was going to join the exhibition because I was just uh, beyond uh, curious <laughs> and in the end I got to meet so many like the friendships and the other the curators that I encountered and the art community that evolved around that first meeting between me and Ahmed I think is a huge indicator and then I moved to Dubai as my first uh, studio that I uh, sort of established and my first gallery that represented me was Quadro. And Art Dubai was like a festival for artists. It was it didn't even feel like collectors were welcome. <laughs> it was just all, all the artists were there. We yeah. were going out on parties, dinners, having conversations, relaxing in the cafes around the fair. And it was such an incredible moment for me because it was a new art fair. And I think a lot of artists never gathered this way. And it became so important to um, understanding the standards. You know, I always say that you need to, um, you need to see it to, to you know, yeah, want to be it. Uh, I don't say that. This is from a book. <laughs> And it's about women, women. Just, and just take credit for it. Remix yeah, it. I just took credit for it. Um, but it's a way like, to, as I say, as just I say, it. <laughs> take it from the book, <laughs> just do it. Uh, the Nike shoe. Um, but yeah, I didn't see any um, elder artists uh, growing up or even uh, when I started my career, I didn't understand what it meant to be an artist, a lifelong artist. And through these networks of friends and uh, regional friends and international friends that I was able to understand that um, art is something that gives a lot of people a, a long life. Uh, yeah. They live happier lives. And uh, especially for women, they make the best art later on in their years. So like, you know, the best is yet to come. So that even if your art is terrible in the beginning of your career, you know that um, it'll mature and it'll become much more interesting because I've seen it um, yeah. in many, many artists. When you think about those, those earlier years in Dubai, do you and and now you look around you know you go to some event at you know at misc or something like that in, in riyadh and do you ever look around and you say oh my god you were back you were there back then and you were ba there back then yeah. and you used to have hair and you were there back then <laughs> um in, in a way whenever i hear those stories from those types of people it's almost like the contemporary art world that exists that's very at least not exists that is very um uh sort of uh prevalent in uh in uh Saudi right now it's almost like it was like weirdly incubated in Dubai in those sort of early years does that sound right I agree it was uh Dubai Sharjah uh, and Abu Dhabi um were incubators Bahrain um Kuwait through Sultan Gallery and um and of course, Doha, Qatar, uh, with the exhibitions that they brought to the region, incredible. And, you know, I, I saw works by uh, most famous Iraqi artists uh, in Doha. Thank, yani thank, thankfully, I got to see them. And 
you know, I think uh, I don't like it when people are oh, surprised and this is a moment, something's happening. Is it uh, the money? I just feel that it's a, a natural evolution of an art scene and uh, it started somewhere and it ended somewhere else. Maybe it doesn't follow the narrative of another art economy uh, uh, that is in America or Europe or Asia. We, I remember Dubai started off with galleries and galleries took on the role of institution. Um, art fair, the art fair was not just collectors, it was a space for thinking. You know, do you remember the art forum um, uh, and the content of all these art forms were exciting uh, platform. I mean, you heard thought that you'd never uh, heard of uh, within our region. It was exciting times, the magazines that started coming up. Uh, and I think all of that uh, fed into what's happening in Saudi. We have a very mature uh, art market, not mature, but yani, it exists, let's say, an existing art market, a good interest, um, educated artists. Uh, there's some academia, some. When I started uh, with art, there's nobody writing about uh, uh, art in, in the region. It's yeah. very rare that you go look through PhDs here and there. You might find some, but, you know, they're, they're usually the same names. Um, now academia is just uh, insane. The publishing, the podcasts, um, there's so much knowledge out there. I think this is just uh, another uh, step in, in the journey of what it is uh, for the region's art, art yeah. uh, history. And, you know, we have, when we say art history in the region, we're, we have to include because you know, okay, Saudi Arabia is a a, a late comer, but you know, we have to recognize that uh, the art schools that existed in Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, um, and you know, the northern uh, North Africa. So Sudan, yeah, of course. yeah, Sudan. Yeah, I mean, these are uh, there's an amazing show here now in London uh, for Sudanese artists, and these are people who have been making art 50s, 20s. Uh, and it's so uh, ignorant to neglect that uh, uh, and say it is separate from my history. For sure. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about, we we mentioned earlier at Arpala, and um, um, some people have seen these images of the trampolines right and you are behind this this show which i think is called now you see me now you don't um or this this artwork um and so my my question is are you reluctant to be known <laughs> as sort of the trampoline lady the lady who built these trampolines <laughs> how do you feel about them becoming so sort of iconic and did you expect that to be true no, not at all, Mikey. I tell you, when I uh, this artwork really started off with a completely different concept. Um, I wanted to put in a net uh, through the whole valley, and so that you could climb that net and sort of just float in the middle of that uh, canyon. And uh, and then I found out that in order to put that net together, they would have to drill uh, into the mountains uh, every half meter. Uh, six meters deep, it, like just, it felt so invasive and I felt so bad. I was like, I cannot, impossible. I, I mean, so I was like, okay, let's go back to the drawing board. And uh, this was after my concept was accepted and we signed the contract. I had to go back to the curator and say, I'm changing it. And, you know, I thought about this, um, you know, I was just sitting in the sand looking at how, you know, the little waves that sands create and how the moon hits it. And then the moon is really like bright because there's no light pollution. And that's where the idea sort of came uh, regarding these um, light circles. And uh, yeah, the artwork uh, was installed uh, through uh, sandstorms and drama and shifting things and food poisoning and uh, freezing, freezing desert cold. It was such a journey, but it was amazing to hang out with all the artists. All of us were going through the same thing together. Um, and then suddenly the artwork 
I really thought that the commissioners were going to um, sort of leave it on for a week and get rid of it because what a, uh, what, what's Manal thinking? Putting, she put trampolines in the desert and walked away. And I was so worried that they wouldn't understand the minimalism and the concept and and they loved it. Uh, the audiences reacted so far. People were crying after jumping on them. There was something very, very, it, it's not trampolines. It's just that moment that you have with nature and your body being activated and that floating sense. And then, you know, sort of revisiting joy. And, you know, as adults, you don't uh, get invited to jump a lot. And a lot of um, elders were jumping and, um, sort of uh, reconnecting to childhood and, and happiness. And and then in the end, everybody that played um, started asking about what is an artwork? What is a public artwork? What does it mean to enjoy an artwork? You don't need to feel alienated and distant from it. This is part of the whole, um, my concept of removing the frame from my artworks and trying to um, bring people closer to the idea of creative interaction. Um, to be called the trampoline lady. I wear it with pride, Mikey. Actually, there's when I was installing this work, there was a guy that was coming in to help us um, tighten the trampolines. Yeah. And and they they called him the trampoline king, uh, royalty. And uh, yeah. and I think I might have to fight him now for the title of trampoline queen. Uh, compared to his, uh, pay-per-view viewing. I like <laughs> Um, since we're on the subject of Al Ula, um, you have some exciting uh, news related to that. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're working on. Um, I've recently been commissioned to make another artwork that is land art based, um, that is uh, much bigger in scale than uh, now you see me, now you don't. Uh, they've invited five artists, uh, three Americans and two Saudis. Um, it is uh, Ahmed Madir from Saudi Arabia, myself, uh, Agnes Dennis uh, from New York, Mike Heitzer uh, from Nevada, and uh, James Terrell from California. These are all um, really elder artists. Uh, they are uh, pioneers in, in land art. Uh, they're basically between their 80s and 90s. So this is really exciting to really have uh, have them produce uh, an artwork that is with no limitations and the sense of dream, you know? And so we get to see maybe what well, Mike Heitzer just unveiled a whole city that he's been building for the past 40 years. So for him to now leave that work and start working on a new project in, in the desert of Saudi Arabia is very exciting. And I'm very, very honored and privileged to have been invited to um, also make a work um, yeah, between uh, two mountains and a valley. Uh, it's a huge undertaking. It's um, due to be finished in two years from now. The title of the work is uh, uh, Oasis of Stories, and it is a labyrinth uh, based on the old town of Al-Ula, the last inhabited town of uh, the ancient cities. And, um, and it was built to look like a labyrinth in order to protect the local residents. Uh, so they know, you know, they can see the stranger because everybody knows how to get through the city and so i'm using that as the the first layer uh the second layer of the artwork is to make um you know the transforming into invisible maybe uh, let's uh, because i my work really looks at things as they transform and change and sometimes they disappear and so for me uh the people of al-ula have now been exposed to the global world, Every, they belong to the, uh, the the story of humanity and will they themselves and their stories disappear? And as they live in an area that has one of the largest libraries of inscriptions on stone, so humanity throughout millennia has written their stories uh, on these stones. Where is the story of the people of Al-Urna? And I'll be running... Uh, year-long sessions with uh, the community 
uh, trying to uh, have them document their stories and place them on the walls of the labyrinth that I'm building in the Amazing. middle of the desert. <laughs> That's incredible. So, so, so exciting. Um, okay, I want to switch to our quick Q&A because somehow we're uh, close to time. So let's do these four quick questions before we wrap up. So first question is, what are you reading or watching right now? Um, I am an avid Star Trek fan. Uh, Amazing. And... Uh, I've been watching with my husband, who's also the same day, a diehard fan. We've been watching Star Trek, I think, throughout our whole relationship of many, many years. And, you know, we just uh, start from the very beginning and go through all of them. And the reason I love watching them is that they constantly explore time and space, mm -hmm. philosophical concepts, um, ethical content. And I highly recommend a lot of my art is inspired by Star Trek. I just don't... I don't nerd out on people, but I do really love the conversations and um talking. Do you have a favorite version, a favorite um sort of uh uh episode or like that's no no, no like favorite yeah, favorite season, favorite sort of uh um, John Luke Picard, anything that has John Luke Picard, which is um captain, uh is is where uh my heart uh, really is but i love deep space nine i mm -hmm. uh, the concepts on that being not a moving ship but a a, a constant a location where everybody docks that for me also is at all. it's not nerd docks uh no i love i love that i love that so much <laughs> um next question is who would you love to shadow for a day past or present oh my goodness i've done shadowing before it, it was quite exciting i i shadowed um uh, the then director of uh, the South Bank Center. Uh, and I also shadowed the director of the Barbican. These are women that were leading museums and institutions. That was very, very interesting. Sometimes boring, but sometimes very exciting. I just needed to see it. Who would I very shadow cool. today? I'd stick to, uh, I would, I have no idea. I should have thought about these questions before, Mikey. No, I would say okay. somebody. I would love to shadow somebody that's like sort of uh, uh, working in, you know, leading a country. Like the complexity of the decisions they're making. Um, maybe shadow uh, my niece uh, who is twelve years old, and and what does it mean to be a twelve-year-old girl in today's world? And uh, how different it is from my world. I think I would love to do that. Um, yeah, I would cool. love to. Yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. go on forever. I can float in this idea, Mikey. Okay. <laughs> what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, I don't think people misunderstand. I don't know. I I don't have a real deep... Un I, mean, I don't have this really stuck to narrative that you either understand it or you must understood. Walk away. Um, I like to keep it uh, open and and welcoming, and any any ideas can come through here. The only thing that annoys me is when somebody looks at my work and goes through the whole journey of othering um, women, othering me, othering my culture, or anything. That just you are different than me, but they use my art as a tool to say, oh my God, I don't understand it so bad that it's because it's so different from me. Uh, that for me means uh, I failed uh, in, in presenting an artwork that speaks to the humanity and the person in front of it. Amazing. And then the last question before we wrap up is outside of the world of art. I'm sure there's a long list of people, uh, amazing artists who you admire and who inspire you. But outside of the world of art, is there a place that um, constantly gives you inspiration or a person's work who constantly gives you inspiration for new pieces and new uh, ideas? Well, um, I absolutely love reading uh, women authors uh, and especially uh, pe women who uh, usually write in the academic kind of style. And then sometimes they say, oh, I'm in the mood to write fiction. 
Mm. I like I like that. And so one good example is Sahar Khalifa. She's a Palestinian um, feminist writer. She writes these wonderful, beautiful stories. Um, and the first one I read, uh, I had borrowed it from my friend, May. Um, it was called Mudakirat um, Imra'a So Memoirs of an Unrealistic Woman. Just, it was life-changing when I read that and I loved it. So this is a kind of... You know, and then these kind of things, um, I have a series of books that travel with me everywhere I go in the world. It's because I just read them over and over and over again because they, I just continually um, uh, unfold, unfold, unfold open ideas. Um, that's one kind of... Wait, what, what's the series? Uh, Sahar Khalifa. Oh, that's the series that goes with you everywhere you... Ever, oh, everywhere the series of books. Oh, I have... No, no. Um, uh, I have a book called Fiqh al-Lugha al-Arabiyya, which is like a, a dictionary of Ar- Arabic words. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were categorized. It's not a dictionary. It's like a, it's a weird uh, categorization made a thousand years ago by an author during the Abbas era. This is the Arabic. jurisprudence of the, of the Arabic language. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, endless, endless entertainment for me. Um, what else? I have, uh, which sits right here, Artificial Hells by um, Claire Bishop, uh, which is, uh, she's one of the people that I think have prominently written about participatory art. Uh, you know, I read everything. She, um, you know, it's just interesting to read her stuff. And I take this book with me everywhere because I, I go back to it as a reference. Yeah, I can go, like, I have a library in front of me. Okay, amazing. I'm not going to go through my library. <laughs> okay, the last question comes from Alia in the chat, which is, can you tell us a little uh, a little about the Family Tree Project to include women in the tree? Um, that was uh, an artwork titled Tree of Guardians. It was presented... Uh, last time uh, in the Riyadh uh, Biennale, at the Riyadh Biennale, uh, and the Tree of Guardians was made uh, um, many, many years ago, 2013. And uh, what I back then I was investigating um, things like when you know women's names being invisible you know people pr- yeah. refusing to pronounce their names or uh you know like the magazine series that i was talking about earlier about no face no voice and so i decided to pose the question when do women disappear from memory like if they're not documented visually their names are not pronounced in public what what happens to their memory and so i i and what triggered it is i went and asked my parents like what what are the names of my grandmothers? And they could only remember two generations. And then after that, it's a Nurat, they call them the two Nuras with no last names. So they know their first name is Nura, but who is her family? We don't know. And so I started a series of um, workshops uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia's uh, main cities. And I started in Khobar, then I went to Riyadh, and then finally ended in Jidda. And hundreds, hundreds of women came. I just posted it on my Facebook and Instagram and things like that. And, and they appeared and we discussed the topic of memory and, and, and it turned into a whole festival during the participatory sessions. Women came with, uh, you know, henna uh, with their grandmother's names on it. Um, uh, they gave me gifts. Uh, there were uh, moments where people were like, we would like, we would like the microphone, please. They're like there's an urge to get on the stage and tell a story of her grandmother and people, the women clapped for each other. It was just, yeah. it's so wonderful. And in the end, we drew maternal only family trees and represented those drawings because we had to count how many generations. Uh, so I'd give you, if you had uh, three generations, I'd give you three leaves and you would put the names of the people on those generations. And we hung the tree based on that. And it turns out, during that time, uh, uh, only nine women uh, were uh, remembered and they were part of the uh, 11th generation of women. Wow. That's how far uh, memory of Saudi women was. Incredible. Incredible. Um, 
Alia, thank you so much for the question. So we're going to wrap up for the listeners who can't see the screen and listening to the podcast right now. If you want to learn more about Manav's work, you can go to her website, which is M-A-N-A-L-D-O-W-A-Y-A-N.com. And Manav, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's it's an honor to be able to sort of pull back the curtain and hear a little bit from your perspective. Well, thank you, Mike. I really enjoyed it. I always enjoy talking to you anyway. So, I feel the same thank way. you for having me.